Welcome to another King's Russia radio show. So this is uh, 10 past 9 on Mondays, 10 past 9 uh, UK time. So I've got another three amazing games of Gary Kasparov uh, to show you. Just want to make sure things are muted over here. All right. Uh, so this first game I'd like to show you is against Leonard Yurtiev. Uh, so this was played in 1981, Moscow. Uh, so Leonard Yurtiev, uh, he's, uh, unfortunately he's, he's not around. He died at the age of 52 years old. He's not around nowadays. He was a grandmaster who defeated many strong players, according to Chess Games.com, uh, including Tao, Ivanchuk, Morozovich, he also beat the youngest broth at one po at one time, and also Aronian. Uh, so, very strong player. Let's have a look at this game. So, Kasparov playing white, d4. Yurtiev plays knight f6. We have c4, e6. We go into actually a Nimza engine defense. Let me put on light book and add a convincer as well. Okay. The Rubinstein variation E3, very solid, reliable system. Uh, we have castling. Bishop D3 now is played, which is the most common move actually in light book. And black plays the most common response. So clamping down on that sensitive e4 square. Um, now, quite often knight f3 is played in here. That's the most common book move, it seems, in the majority of games from this position. For example, knight f3, this has been seen a lot before, this position. But anyway, in this game, now we get a, a variance here after this move. We get actually, instead of knight f3, we get c takes d5. Black most often just takes with the pawn. If black takes with the knight here, white might be getting a small advantage actually with queen c2 looking at h7. This position might actually be quite, it's quite good for white. So let's go back. Uh, so the most common way of recapture seems to be from my book without question e takes d5 I mean it seems to open up the bishop why wouldn't you want to do this in principle this bishop activated now knight g e2 so it avoids any potential pin uh, if the knight had gone to f3 quite often here rook e8 has been played in this game we see knight bd7 white castles Potentially d5 is sensitive here. Uh, queen b3 might be handy, but also queen c2. These two spots. Black supports d5. And then we have this f3 plan, uh, which well signifies white might be interested in playing e4 and e5. This would push away the defensive knight from h7. And also, of course, this bishop is opened up. Now, black wants to interfere with this. And against this, I mean, white has committed to slightly weakening the structure. Black tries to uh, make sure e4 is discouraged and plays c5 in this position. Okay, so now though, with the bishop on b4, white would love the center to be strengthened uh, and encourages bishop takes c3 with a3. Yeah, now if taking this wasn't played, actually C takes was played. If taking, I think white can comfortably just take here and then still look forward to breaking through with E4 later. It might need some preparation, but uh, it's a pleasant enough position for white. But black doesn't do that. Um, he plays actually C takes D4. And Gasparov is te in content to actually just to open up the bishop here. Bishop goes back, so we have an interesting position, but still, white has something here. This d5 is slightly vulnerable 
in this particular position and more pressure is put on it knight f4 threatening that pawn black plays an awkward looking retreat knight b8 just to defend d5 and here actually uh there is indirectly more pressure being put on d5 with Xparov's next move which you might think is a little bit controversial it might not be a move that appeals to you because uh, actually we're talk generalizations and this is one of them which is kind of you know, broken but it's totally justified in this position it seems um, to put more pressure on d5 uh, Sparov plays g4 uh, you know engines like it as well you know g5 is now threatened potentially Uh, just to win d5 to dislodge this defender bishop d6 now okay again this is a discouraging move first point is uh, the pawn uh, is better not be taken because you'd think bishop takes h2 but that might actually be stronger here this is actually okay for white that's not okay but actually there might even be stronger here just just doing this because this knight's a bit unstable actually in this position and white has weakened his king side this position might actually be a better worth better way to play it like this just to try and go for the attack without losing the dark square bishop so it's not that tempting to take on d5 here but also let's have a look at g5 this wasn't played either king h1 was played why not g5 now well if this happens a little bit similar to what happens in the game actually black could take a knight h5 this isn't so bad for white either actually if g5 had been played it doesn't seem so bad but uh actually Xparov plays king h1 so he's reserving g5 seeing if black wants to do anything about it black didn't explicitly want to do anything about this or this in fact I mean, you might think protect the pawn or do something about g5. What does black want to do? I mean, say black did want to do something about g5 of h6. That's not so hot. White could build up with queen d3 coming up next. Let's just have a look, look at this. This position is, is probably dangerous where knight takes his friends to try and get to h7. So, yeah, h6 doesn't really help black, and protecting the pawn doesn't help black. Black doesn't want to give up a light square bishop just to protect d5. So what he does is actually very, very interesting. He just ignores this situation of both the d-pawn and g5. Black just plays rook e8. Okay, let's have it examined first, just taking this pawn. Is this is it actually on? Knight takes, knight takes. This wasn't played. Hold on. This position as mentioned before is good dynamic compensation for black and h5 is actually quite a logical move if the knight goes back then as knight takes d4 i mean it's it's not so great this position and actually black can have good good pressure here uh developing so yeah xparov is not tempted just to win a pawn there in the center he doesn't want to do that he, he wants to make the king a top priority he plays g5 and the game actually starts to revolve about uh, the knights now this knight um, now the knight can't go to h5 at the moment so black snaps off f4 to give the knight the h5 square with tempo and it's really interesting play now quite forceful move is played uh, by Xparov here against this knight really he plays a very forcing move bishop takes forcing black's reply and now f4 forcing something to do about the knight we have g6 so the knight's a little bit uncomfortable there and here now back to the d5 question queen f3 looking at to win d5 or is it is it it's dual purpose actually because also f5 this f file is dangerous 
Uh, so that isn't the real kind of threat here. Uh, black would again have sufficient compensation. But black kind of makes it clear this is poison at this point by playing b6. This would be a total disaster, of course, to take now because there's like bishop b7 pinning the queen. Or knight takes again, bishop b7 looks pretty good. This position is just not good to have with white. Uh, there's all sorts of tactics here. Uh, even rook c2 is possible. It's too much uh, counterplay. It's, you, you don't want this position with white with a self pin. Forget that. That's not the point. The point is not about d5 again. But it seems Kasparov is ready to provide the d5 kind of weakness as a ghost for black to worry about at different point, points in this game. But the real problem with this position is twofold. This knight is a bit awkward and this f file now is dangerous after f5. So black can't take without, he's going to lose that knight if he takes. You know, we could just take here and then take here. Can't. So black is has to sit back here and watch this f file open up. Plays rook b7 defending the f7 point. But uh, interestingly here the knight is fully stranded by this next move which seems a bit committal because you'd think you want to open up things but it might not be in white's interest to play something like fg it might not be that easy to proceed here instead we see a stranding move stranding the knight the knight really hasn't got g7 to return back to now but at this point here uh, it's also a little bit not entirely clear how white at the moment will exploit this knight he some moves away from putting pressure on h5 uh, white is threatening potentially the d5 pawn potentially uh, we see bishop e6 now rook a e1 queen d6 and now a very nice move rook e5 which means actually queen e3 next will put pressure on that e file we see rook d8 and now this move queen e3 i mean this was also of course attacking d5 d5 was actually being threatened there so black defended that but now this switch with queen e3 and it's a very clever move because it's simultaneously it's putting pressure on the e file one day and we've got a form pawn here which is one of my favorite things to have in chess we've got a dangerous form pawn but how can we get a queen to h6 i mean the knight's also defending g7 right uh, but how do we get a queen to h6 later we see black just trying to generate some counterplay here with b5 but bishop e2 now threatens to just take off this defender of g7 and you might think well is that knight's kind of stranded why would you want to take that off black for the moment black black is getting actually a very bad position here he plays b4 after a takes it looks as though superficially black's generating some sort of pressure over here but now bishop takes h5 is played with a great move in mind in this position so what was the purpose of taking on h5 there's a really fantastic idea here which kind of celebrates the form pawn actually in a very elegant manner can you see what white plays if i asked you on strip so my question is white's play what would you play yeah on play chess please by the way hide the score sheet if you go away from the notation tab so white play if you hide hide score sheet please if you've got the uh hide score sheet tab so white play i'll give you like 20 seconds if you want to call out some moves what would you play in this position what do you reckon the idea ah
okay the idea is actually g6 now the immediate implication if fg then we have rook takes e6 that's unplayable right but hg now surely the queen can step back to f8 right if we played queen h6 doesn't the queen just come into the fence and in fact white might be struggling here after say a queen is repelled back king h7 then black has queen h6 next and so what about this form pawn so what yeah but white doesn't have to go straight to h6 in this position in fact there are two very very strong moves because i've played one of them a really really uh strong move in this position so not because yeah he knows going to h6 the queen could actually repel yeah with queen f8 so here's another neat little trick so uh white's play here Drink water. Oh, my question on flexions. <laughs> Happy birthday to Jean Nielsen, by the way, on the stream, on this, on on stream, YouTube stream. Okay, so uh, okay, I'm drinking water as well. Okay, so the other question. Okay, but on, coming back to the chess, <laughs> there's actually two really strong moves here. Kasparov plays one of them, Rook takes e6. Now give yourself also points for this. Apparently this is mega strong. Let's have a look at Kasparov's move and come back to this position. This is played. So if Queen takes, we have Queen h6. There's no Queen f8. Black's going to sort of uh, have to give up with Queen to stave off mate. It's not very good. Now, so f takes is virtually forced. And the idea is not f7 check here. Because after King g7 apparently white has nothing here no the idea is queen h6 so threatening mate and let's look have a look at the fences here queen f8 is very different now flavor to it with this liberated pawn we have queen takes queen takes rook g1 check is crushing it's a mate in two actually obviously well yeah it's mating too so it makes all the difference to actually first of all liberate this pawn yeah because then nothing's working defensively uh, because actually we've also undermined this pawn chain trio is dismantled so g6 has been torn apart at the seams this rook takes e6 what has it done it's kind of undermined black's defensive pawn chain by playing rook takes e6 so this is just crushing black tries to play like this rook b7 but actually resigns with this move white can just in this position it maybe felt as helpless white can take now two defenses king of fake or king h8 if king h8 f7 threatens queen h6 to which i don't believe there's any defense so we try this rook f6 with the idea of taking here stopping uh, there's no there's no actual defense here uh example um just token example Yeah, like that, checkmate. Yeah, so rook f6 would be supporting a quick knockout with queen h6 and queen uh, supporting queen h6 there. And if queen queen g7, we can take. And here, we can either win the queen, or even stronger is queen e5, apparently. Where, yeah, this is horrible. This sort of thing is checkmate. That pawn's actually playing a role here. 
Okay, so it's, it's really a crushing position. Uh, so Black actually resigned with his move, which is a little bit unusual to resign with your move, but he did apparently resign with this move, Rook B7. Let's have a look at the engine uh, hack as well. The engine hack was actually uh, Rook takes H5. So the threat here is check, check and mate on G7. Say black tries to defend with queen f8, rook g1, fret takes, takes, and rook h8, e.g. just to show that. <clears throat> Winning, e.g. Yeah, this is crushing. That's the engine hat. There's no defense to rook takes h5 either, it seems. It shows it's actually a really strong position. If takes. Hmm, there's an interesting resource here, though. Crikey. Wow. What the hell is this about? Now, you might think the idea was check, but no, black just escapes. <laughs> there's nothing there. But, 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 oh my god, this is just theoretical, really, I don't actually know why this works at the moment, now if queen h6 you might think for rook g1, that doesn't work, queen f8, and if check we've got bishop g4, but there's a move here the engines thinking this is really good for white now i don't know i'm, I'm mystified by it let's have a, a tactical test here <laughs> white to play here sorry about this this is just indulging some mysterious resources that are in the position white to play here with plus 17 believe it or not I can tell you it's not queen h6 or rook g1. It's not queen h6 or rook g1. I, I don't understand it at the moment. Anyone got any ideas? It's not Queen H6 or Rook G1. I have to give you that clue. <laughs> I think I think I've got a glimmer. I think I've got a glimmer. I can't see the actual variation. But I think I have got a clue now. Only now. Oh, come on, on stream. A thousand points if you can guess it. Come on. This is an engine resource. It's an engine resource. It's not Queen G5. King F8. And there's nothing. Sorry, this is just an engine resource. It's amazing uh, the resources in, in a chess position. I'll give you a clue, right? I think this is my clue. I'm giving you a visual clue, right? I can give you another in a few seconds. I, I think I have a hunch. It's about this. I'll give you another clue now, right? Just save a bit of time. I think, I think this is what this move is about. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's about this.
It's not knight takes d5, by the way. Because then we got this check. That's just losing. Not knight takes d5. Don't be silly. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to show you. Because I'm not entirely sure myself what the hell is going on here. Okay, knight e4. I believe it's something to do with this. I believe, on first glance, it might be something to do with this. It's hitting the queen right. First of all, if queen f8, then check. And we're just ripping open the a-file because this is blocking the king. We can rule this out. We're just killing. Okay, so the critical thing, what on earth is this doing? D takes. I believe it's to do with this. I might be wrong. Queen h6. Queen takes. So we've got rook g1 check. And if here... Oh, this is amazing. I don't know why that looks so easy and why that wasn't possible before. Let's just check this. Why, 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 why didn't this work before in this position? Oh god, I got it wrong. My clue was bad. Black has rook takes d4 here. Controlling g4. I think check. We got rook g4. Sorry, my clue was wrong. I gave you a terrible clue. And this is actually black's better here. Black's better here. Black survives that apparently. Well, survives all. No, what it actually was doing. Sorry, I think what this actually is doing now. Let me just. So Kasparov played this, which we can understand. But this one, what I'm saying is this position. Knight e4 seems to block the rook coming to g4. Right, right, right. Sorry, I had, this, uh, I had this idea it was about queen g5 to c5. I wasn't totally sure. We're, it blocks it blocks the g file. It hits the queen. So we've blocked the rook coming to g4. So when we play queen h6, yeah, this position, you know, rook takes d4. It's not coming to g4. So we have time for rook g1 without rook g4. All right, that was that was. I gave a completely erroneous clue. So, sorry, it's just a bit of indulgence there. It was a good position to analyse, maybe. I don't know, but um, yeah. But no, this is the simple way which Kasparov plays. Just rook takes e6. But yeah, this is this is pretty incredible. Rook takes h5. Yeah, incredible. Knight e4. Yeah, rook g1. King f8, and if here, king's just escaping. You just can't make this work. Yeah, this position, you cannot make this work. Um, sorry, what takes h5? This position here. So if you play check, king f8. This position in ninety four. You know what? It's, yeah, so it's about this rook being able to defend the G file. All right, okay. Anyway, sorry. Coming back to the game. Uh, what was this game about then? Anyway, um, <clears throat> let's have a look. The final position. I want to just recall the game in a nutshell, as far as I understand it. So it was from a Nimzo engine uh, defense. Um, and it seems as though white was initially playing for f3 and e4. So black didn't mind using his c pawn twice. He went from c6 to c5 just to make sure uh, the center wasn't going to explode with e4, e5. Because Prof was content with that position anyway. He had some pressure on d5 for much of the game. He drove the knight to a bad place on h5. And it's interesting, he gained the tempo by taking on b8, giving up the dark square bishop. 
to sort of imprison the knight on h5. And then he really imprisoned it later with f5, f6. The knight didn't even have g7. He put a lock on the e-file and with queen e3, it wasn't just about the e-file pressure. It was about a potential breakthrough on the diagonal to h6. So he played bishop e2 to h5. And then that breakthrough move, getting the queen to h6, but by first playing rook e6 to make it even more effective. So it was a kind of nice celebration of a form pawn, actually. That's one of the main stories about this game, I think. One of the main themes is how that form pawn, in the end, is absolutely crushing, even if you're the exchange down here. Because black's king safety has been really undermined uh, in this final position. Okay, so, uh, all right, let's go on to uh, another game. <clears throat> Hubner against Kasparov, which is, Hubner was one of the top German players, I believe. Let's have a quick bio on Robert Hubner. <clears throat> I'll get a pronunciation, hopefully, as well. So this is Tilburg, 1981. He's 67 years old, he's still around. He was, um, <clears throat> Dr. Robert Hubner was born in Cologne in 1948. 16, he tied for the first in the European Championship. In 1971, he earned the International Grandmaster title by qualifying for the World Championship candidates. He also qualified in 1980, so that's a year before this game. When he reached the finals before losing to Vic's cautionary. So this guy was a real candidate, world championship candidate, just a year before this game. And in 1983, where he lost his quarterfinal match to Vasily Smyslov on the spin of a roulette wheel. Huben still lives in Germany and as of January 2005, was still rated in the world's top 100 players. So great player, world championship candidate player. Uh, let's have a look. So. Kasparov was playing black. I feel bad giving a terrible clue in that last one. I think I just made things even more difficult to guess 94, by the way. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, did, I did say it wasn't 100% certain uh, what was... Uh, anyway. So anyway, let's go on to this game. So Tilburg, 1981. Hubner's white, c4. Kasparov plays knight f6. Knight c3, c5, knight f3, e6. White is content to play just quietly and now opens up, after bishop e7, opens up that center a little bit. After d6, b3, white is content really just to have the double thin chateau position with a bind on black ever playing d5 so it seems an entirely comfortable and harmonious position for white at the moment it's just gonna you know maybe even the bishop can consider bishop a3 as well we have knight bd7 okay so black's got a very flexible pawn structure but is d6 a problem In fact, e4 might be vulnerable though to knight c5 as well. It's not all great for, great news for white in this position. We have queen e3. So if knight c5 here, this can be protected with knight d4 in fact. This didn't happen. We have a6. So yeah, it looks like uh, a big bind on the d5 square. Moroxy binds Sicilian almost like, looks like. How does Kasparov generate counterplay from this position? We have knight d4, queen c7. The classic breaks involve sometimes b5 against this, because this is like one of the only kind of theoretical vulnerabilities to play b5 sometimes. But is b5 working here? I, I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, Let's see, after bishop b2, um, there's no point to play b5 here. But we, what we get is rook fe8. So looking at the queen indirectly, 
as though there might be something going on h3 the bishop just drops back and white continues with a seemingly gorgeous position without having to learn or play too much theory doesn't white just enjoy a kind of glorious looking double fin cheshire uh, position i've actually been on the receiving end of black in a blitz game recently and it wasn't very nice at all i mean it's quite dangerous this kind of just pressure and the it's it's kind of dangerous what is black actually doing if he hasn't got any um apparent um breakout move here what is what is black doing uh rookie two but the thing is d6 is not under huge fire here and his brother actually plays g6 now as they might be interested in uh putting his bishop here rook a e1 queen b8 as though there might also be interested interest potentially in queen a8 you know putting some pressure on e4 queen d2 we have bishop g7 so it's a hedgehog you know called the hedgehog formation sometimes is black actually what is black actually doing is he just waiting for whites to do something we have queen d1 and white's waiting for black well knight c5 is played here the bishop drops back and we have rook c8 bishop g5 that's kicked it goes back to c1 so it's creating some more weaknesses Smurf has moved like quite a few pawns here six of his pawns are on the third rank it's proper hedgehog rook ed8 and proper double fianchetto double fianchetto against hedgehog who wins here who's better here actually who do you think who's better double fianchetto versus hedgehog yeah white or black what, what would you prefer here to have uh at this point white or black it's a tense i don't know there's a lot of interesting possibilities but after this move actually something is about to potentially get exciting so this is the moment i'm asking who do you think is better doesn't white have everything under control here Smurf creates some trouble actually in the position he plays b5 this is not what the engines like by the way the engines here well Houdini actually thinks black is is slightly better with h5 believe it or not so say this h4 say say this then b5 <laughs> okay but Xplorov actually doesn't bother with h5 h4 he plays b5 immediately we have c takes and the idea is slightly different here d5 d5 the rook is potentially on the queen right and you might think well so okay let's have a look at a few possibilities here after d5 if b takes bishop takes this is actually better for black it seems where does the rook go say it goes here e5 and white's going to be in a little bit of trouble here this position is not nice at all white sort of is collapsing quite badly yeah this binds this proxy bind is crumbling in b takes and if so white plays uh he doesn't play e5 either is now this and actually this latent x-ray on the queen is handy because we get an almighty pin 
and we get the d3 square so black is actually threatening quite a bit bishop e5 example if the, I don't know say we move the queen over here bishop takes e5 again black ends up being better it seems because he's got things like knight d3 as well so yeah e5 isn't entirely tempting either here so we're left with what was played e takes d5 now it seems as though black's fine here i think one important factor is the, the rook just simply looking at the queen uh, after knight takes uh bishop takes okay white plays b4 in this position Spraf takes on g2 and now okay the, if the knight moved the knight didn't move uh Kasparov played this but if he if he had moved the knight where does he move it then white's just clearly just winning i think Th this is horrible ouch the knight the knight cannot move so e5 was played uh okay so we have b tanks e takes and here maybe white slips up a bit he plays actually kind of defensively with rook d2 well it's not as aggressive as rook e7 uh, he plays rook d2 and i think black's getting the upper hand now after rook takes c5 black might be actually getting the upper hand we have b takes check queen f3 queen takes a6 so it's equal on pawns but black's got this pawn here is that a strength or a liability is it a pass pawn or just a weak pawn it's gained up on with rook ed1 but you know with the absence of the light square bishop in fact Spraff changes the position slightly now the emphasis he's not just protecting the pawn he goes on to try and exploit some of these squares around the king these, these weak and light squares rook f5 is played the queen wants to hang around this diagonal right uh, if we play something like this i don't think this is any good actually uh even even check is is interesting here Th this is okay for black uh but <clears throat> okay so actually the queen wanted to stay on the diagonal we have queen e4 okay so we've got everything on d4 now everything's looking at d4 queen a4 is played this is quite a tricky move actually this is a nice interesting defensive uh move if white tries to gobble the pawn he didn't he played a3 but let's say he does try and gobble the pawn there's an almighty pin actually with rook ft5 and there's a pin this way two pins so the bishop can't move because it drops the queen that's that's uh that's pretty bad that's losing a piece for white so yeah queen a4 is is nice so we have a3 so the pawn's not uh, so easy to win but also it did support rook e8 okay the queen wants to stand the diagonal rook d8 blockading now with rook d3 now we have this move h5 so trying to undermine white's king side a bit rook 1 d2 queen e8 as though there's an idea now to try and get to e4 if this queen can be deflected away from e4 then queen e4 check is a very nice resource to have uh there are some problems in this position now say say white tries to just sidestep his king h4 is is looking a little bit dangerous doesn't want his king necessarily on a dark square here because uh, we've also got this bishop potentially coming out it doesn't really might not want it on on h2 uh, does he want it on g1 
even worse actually which from h6 where does the rook go then there's rook b8 here You've got to be careful about rook b8 f here this check sorry if king here there's nasty stuff going on yeah there's nasty stuff going on yeah so we have this awkward looking move king f1 actually was played so one idea there i believe if this we can play rookie two supported by the king i think that's one idea of playing king f1 okay but kasparov plays rook b8 here the queen doesn't really want to go to g2 although that might apparently be one of the better moves it went to c7 if it goes to g2 queen c8 is dangerous threatening rook takes and queen c1 check that's kind of difficult to, for white here uh this this is a difficult but he didn't want to do that anyway he played actually uh queen c7 but here we get a very very interesting uh combination it's it's apparently it's a crushing move in this position apparently yeah this is a like a plus five move black to play here can you see what black has a very interesting idea here probably very well uh calculated Black's play here. All right now, someone suggested Queen E4. That looks really aggressive, right? But it does lose the rook. <laughs> then King G1, and there's not much. <laughs> yeah it's losing no no so it's not queen e4 not quite but it's an interesting idea it's an interesting idea to bear in mind queen e4 because it might be an ingredient for what's coming next all right okay rook takes b2 was played Okay, with the idea now queen e4 is actually a little bit more effective. It's not losing a rook. In fact, it's attacking a rook here. Okay, uh, white played queen c4. Now you might think, well, what if, what if, okay, queen c4 is the game. Have a look at rook d2 here. Check. Check. And if here, check. This is a forced mate, apparently. This position it's forcing mate in 11 from here anyway that's a forced mate uh, that's crushing absolutely yeah yeah so uh, Brook DD2 doesn't seem to work because of this check yeah and a rookie five doesn't seem to work and this one let's have a quick look at this one check check black would have to give up the queen because the king's in prison here yeah black has to give up the queen that's no good either so those are two obvious ones i've just thought of here uh, if here check this doesn't help check disposition d3 apparently is the most crushing uh and white is in big trouble here 
there's ideas like rook c5 check it's it's horrible it's horrible so yeah um white's defensive try in the game at move 42 was queen c4 now we still get this horrible check driving the king out of its house castle um now actually uh rook e5 might have been pretty strong it is pretty strong as well might be one of the strongest we got to do a rookie one after Bucksmoth also played a very strong move queen g1 threatening a mate in one uh white plays a check first before trying to address this with f4 so f2 is no longer threatened so we have this interesting position here where black is the exchange down but there's a move here which is going to break down the exchange down but white is being broken down with an undermining move h4 this it seems as though there's no defense so h4 Remember, f7 is protected right by the rook there's no easy entry point what does white do about f4 because yeah yeah he, he plays rook b5 trying to exchange off uh that rook um if he plays like this one then check is, is winning the rook uh, so there's, there doesn't seem to be any easy answer to h4 the exchange up here Yeah, so rook, rook b5 was tried. Uh, th this one is, is kind of interesting. Um, but there's other ways uh, around. But let's go with the game continuation, rook b5. Uh, yeah, because, you know, if, if taking, you know, black is just crashing through uh, with this mate threat again. Uh, this, this is horrible. This just loses the rook. It's just horrible. Uh, so yeah we have rook b5 and simply rook takes b5 not minding the exchange of rooks for h takes g3 now so again the exchange down but the king is out and about queen f2 now and this pawn's also dangerous we have queen g5 check and now check here and white resigns here this pawn is now mega dangerous White resigns. If he plays, say, King D2, G2, and how how do we stop this? How does White stop this pawn? If he plays this, Bishop H6, crunch. Because there's going to be Queen F4 check after. As an example, just Queen F4. <laughs> Yeah, it seems this position exchange is just hopeless. What's the point in being the exchange up here? The king's got, again, it's got like the king's safety's been shot down. It's hopeless, isn't it? It's hopeless this position off h4. The engine suggestion was this. apparently strongest well we can't even play we can't even play this apparently these two checks for hg here and then bishop h6 again demonstrates black's superior on the dark squares if, he, if he's breaking through here this is this is really bad news for white yeah his king safety is just gone it's just gone it's just gone it's going to be like losing the rook. He's going to have to. It's hopeless. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. So this game, what was this game about? You know, this game is kind of uh, aesthetically interesting because you know sometimes, quite often, players are attracted to play the double fianchetto against the hedgehog, and B B five is a kind of well known way of generating counterplay at the right time uh 
It seems Sparf chose the right time for b5 followed by d5 when the queen was sitting on that d file. And just all the tactics, specific tactics, seem to work. Whatever way white played it seemed to be worse after that d5 break. <clears throat> Black seems to, if we go back to that critical break position, the engine kind of thinks it's equal here actually. But fascinatingly, as I mentioned behind the scenes, actually this it thought it was black it thought black's actually better here this is like theoretical stuff because why is black better here has has black fundamentally weakened his dark squares with the bishop being here that's the only reason i can think of at the moment why why, why would black be better here let's have a look at this again i mean this is technically black's better Uh, this is dangerous. Say this is played. I don't know. There's, there's different reasons, but I don't know. I don't know. Black Black seems to be wanting to play something like this to weaken the dark squares. If ever that happens, d5 then is probably even better than the game. Yeah, yeah, it's even better than the game. Yeah, it's interesting. The Hedgehog is a tricky customer because it seems as though at one point here, Black's tied down, right? White's got this dream Roxy bind double fianchetto. But it seems as though the engine thinks already Black's better with H5, H4 and B5. Sparf's b5 and d5 is also equal, by the way. I mean, at least, at least it seems equal. Fascinating. Um, there's other tactical factors here. It's not just about the dark squares. This, I think one of the primary ones is the rook staring at the queen, making all the, the d5 break a lot more effective. I think this is really interesting stuff. <clears throat> Why this hedgehog would be effective here. There's also another line, by the way. I just want to show you this. H4. Queen A8. Again, the engine actually loves black hair. Breaking out like this. Because yeah, e4 is under great fire as well here in this position. All of a sudden, everything's conspiring on e4, even b4 potentially. If we go this, again, black's okay. He's got things like this and this. He's okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, interesting. All right, let's have a look at another game now. <clears throat> Sonia Nito against Kasparov, played in Graz 1981. Let's quickly load this game. So Sonia Nito, uh, let's try, is there a pronunciation on that? Probably there isn't. Okay, so, uh, Jamie Sonia Nito was born in Brazil in 1957. He got awarded the IM title in 1980, so that's a year before this game. And the GM title in 1986, so five years after this game. He was the Brazilian champion six times in 1976, 77, 79, 80, 81 and 82. So he played his first interzonal in 1979, finishing fifth overall. 
He was joint second in Havana 1985, first at Zeneca 1986, and won the South American Zonal in 1989. Okay, um, he was the mainstay, mainstay of the Brazilian Olympiad team and also president of the Brazilian Chess Federation from 88 to 92. So he's 59, he's still around. Let's have a look at this game. 19, uh, so 81, knight f3, spoil with the black pieces. Knight f6, c4, c5, we have knight c3, e6, e3. A very solid approach actually this e3 it is the third most popular move in live book so going for a d4 so it seems yes he does play for d4 d5 Sproth is accepting the potentially dreaded isolated queen's pawn sometimes now bishop b5 bishop d6 we have a classic isolated queen's pawn situation where okay white uh, castles here and now plays b3 so it seems you know white's gonna have a nice blockade on d4 but that's not the end of the story necessarily bishop b2 rook c8 rook c1 bishop d6 this has actually been seen quite a few times before this position so it's a classic isolated queen's pawn position. We have bishop b8. Knight b5 now, as though there's something going to be sitting on d4 pretty soon. In fact, after knight e4, yep, the knight goes back here. So it seems like a beautiful blockade on d4. Actually, it's quite funny we had the previous game before because before the opponent's position seemed beautiful in some respects. The double fianchetto to me, it seemed like a beautiful position. But what can Kasparov do to beautiful positions? He can force you to see the dynamic dark sides of it. What What is the dark side of White's position here? Well, this isolated Queen's pawn, it's afforded this nice aggressive knight on e4, which looks at f2 all the time at the moment. Rook e8, h3, and in fact, Kasparov gives up here his light square bishop. He doesn't necessarily want to retreat this, apparently. Although that, yeah, it's, it's not, might, might be a move, but anyway, he gives it up. Okay, we have knight takes f3, and now queen uh, d6, which is not uh, doing anything immediately I mean there's a nice battery on h2 but we've got a defensive knight there right but 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 after queen d3 this defensive knight is challenged directly with knight g5 so if knight takes yes we mate on h2 funny enough white didn't play that he plays rook fd1 not even minding the queen to visit h2 here he's put more pressure on d5 doesn't mind if Kasparov wanted to play knight takes. Um, he didn't. He actually just moved this rook, protecting this pawn. He didn't bother. There's no point doing this. This check doesn't lead anywhere. And d5 is still a problem. So no, he didn't bother with that. He plays actually here. He plays actually rook cd8. Rook cd8. If uh, <clears throat> if if taking here again, um, sorry. If if taking, there's a mate in two because the bishop's blocking in the king. Sorry, that's not that's not possible to take here because of the mate in two. Uh, so we see now uh, king f1, threatening now knight takes g5. The knight goes back. A3. A6. Okay. I have to say, I mean, why in 
has got what he kind of wanted, you know, a nice blockade position against Black's isolated Queen's pawn. What's the matter with White's position? In fact, White's got the bishop pair as well. Yeah? So who do you think's better here at the moment? Uh, white or black? black you think you think black's got enough dynamic play do you because he has got that isolated queen's pawn we have we okay let's see how the game goes queen c2 we have bishop a7 up to something naughty like knight takes f2 here clearly pointing at this structure definitely something naughty is afoot here uh, just to demonstrate that white played bishop d3 if he plays something like b4 knight takes and naughty business ensues yeah this is this is dangerous dangerous to be avoided this possession very dangerous uh white's kind of tied up it looks it looks very dangerous on this diagonal uh white's tied up no, uh, so his move bishop d3, that is one of the perks of a knight on e4 in an isolated queen's position. f2 is often a little bit shaky. So bishop d3 is played, so protecting actually f2. And we could just take with the queen, if nothing else. Uh, it's, not, it's not so bad there. Um, bishop d3, we have queen e7. Yeah, because white's also threatening bishop takes now uh with the idea of then knight g5 and it's it's dangerous so sparse move tries to stabilize the position here of the knight with queen e7 we have rook e1 is he actually threatening anything not particularly so queen e7 rook e1 now we have a rook switching on that third rank. Yeah, our rook's going to come to the third rank here. B4. Rook e6. Just supports the knight a bit more for the moment. B5. That's taken. Bishop takes. H6. Rook cd1. White seems to have a really comfortable position, even with the option of taking out a defender with a d4 square. Rook d8. Queen b3. Threatening that pawn directly now. Queen d6. a4. It's here. Bishop c5 is played now with an idea of reinforcing the bishop with b6. So, so um, if white might have had some intention of using c file pressure at some point so yeah this kind of is interesting rookie two b6 this construction uh king g1 we have knight e7 now knight d4 now the rook switches to g6 Remember, this knight's covering f5. Otherwise, that would have been dangerous knight f5. Bishop d3. And here we see queen d7. Threatening naughty business with queen takes h3. The king goes out of that pin on the g pawn. Knight f5 now threatening to put a knight into h4 which would be really dangerous for these two pawns because queen's looking at h3 the rook's looking at g2 these pawns are under great scrutiny all of a sudden if knight h4 is allowed white takes on e4 trying to snap up these dangerous knights and this looks very very sensible in the circumstances this looks great targeting this d file knight h4 is played anyway believe it or not
And doesn't this look like a blunder to anyone? Because these two rooks, you know, they, they look as though they could do something on, on the default, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, what was played is actually knight e6. It looks as though, isn't it just like dangerous, this position? I mean, also to consider is knight f5. But apparently this position, the exchange down, is is very good for black because rook takes g2 is threatened. There'll actually be very little uh, defense here. Uh, you know, if this, this is, this is crushing, this is crushing. There's, there's actually very little defense in this position if this knight f5 had been played to win an exchange. Believe it or not, you might want to volunteer a defense, but I'll just show you this for a moment. Queen takes f2, threatening mate. Queen takes f5, and it's difficult to defend. Rook takes g2, threatening all sorts. Yeah, check. This is crazy, but apparently, <laughs> black wins this position. <laughs> Plays rook g1 here. That's, that's mate, sorry, yeah. Let's just rewind that for a moment. Why knight f5 isn't destructive? So just just to recap, knight f5 doesn't doesn't win. It wins an exchange and loses the king. This position here. Queen. I mentioned queen d5. This pins the rook here, yeah? but f5 unpins the rook. And then we have rook takes g2 and this is winning despite queen g8 check and despite queen g7 this king yeah. it's winning for black so that had to be calculated probably knight f5 but also knight e6 had to be calculated knight e6 was the game continuation and we've got similar patterns emerging or have we? No, actually. Because if queen takes e6, white would take on e6 and then just win that exchange and it would be the exchange up and a winning game. Totally winning for white. No, against knight e6, something else was played. Uh, yeah, queen takes d2 was played. So we have two rooks which is, seems to be fair enough for the queen two rooks for the queen knight and bishop each same color bishop by the way pressure on f2 and g2 there we have knight f4 now rook g5 and king g1 was played here why well, black is threatening, rook takes f2. That's dangerous. So king g1 seems to protect against rook takes f2. We have knight f3 check, king f1. Now there's a great move, mysterious move played, well, seemingly crazy move. I don't know what to say, but it is the best move apparently. in the position yeah it's a, it's a really strong tactical move in this position black to play here i don't know if you can guess it or you know the reason why as well so yeah 200 points if you can guess it black to play here hmm. 
it's actually a famous game i've seen this game many years back by the way it's it's kind of a famous game this one and i thought it was stunning at the time <laughs> it's like advanced tactics as well but no black's got two rooks for the queen yeah so in theory okay but black's got to be careful you know if he moves his knight back i think it's a disaster yeah it is a disaster because bang and then queen c3 forking both rooks and if black has to give up the exchange then this isn't that hot this position uh white's gonna be uh doing well here for example like this with a5 to follow and black's on the back foot yeah so he can't actually retreat his uh, apparently technically he can't really retreat the knight and if he retreats the knight if he puts the knight there this apparently is good then this and again black would be on the back foot even though he's got two rooks for the queen it's tricky they're not entirely coordinated in this position so it needs a precise move okay so he played bishop takes e3 so potentially both rooks are now looking at this g pawn for a moment now if queen takes e3 this wasn't played then check and mate so that's not a good idea to play queen takes e3 hmm. now if g takes f3 then there's still a mate in two with check and mate so yeah by elimination uh, we have f takes e3 and the idea now is amazing actually it's rook d takes g2 which vacates d2 for this lovely fork possibility so now if white takes then there's knight d2 check and black's winning is just slightly exchange up yeah so yeah that's that's the thing knight d2 has been introduced so gains an important tempo queen c3 but here now rook h2 is played threatening mate knight e2 defends g1 it seems a really uh really black wants to play rook g g2 yeah threatening mate but if this was the case white would have a perpetual check with check and queen f5 it would be a perpetual check because black could never do g6 because he gets mated so in fact before playing uh this little detail affects things this little bouncing detail he plays actually in this position king h7 first queen goes there anyway as if ready again for this but now instead, instead of this we go back to that draw we have instead in this position rook h1 check king f2 and in fact knight d2 threatening mate here uh, to which white would have to uh, give up uh, the queen uh, or it's worse white white uh, gave up here um, if if knight g3 check check now if here uh rook takes b2 is really good white's losing a load of material and if yeah 
or here, just just why it's losing a load of material. Yeah, it's it's hopeless there. So knight knight d two is a killer blow actually. Uh, knight g three is no good. Uh, what what else uh, about to, to stop rook f one? There's not much else here. I mean, you put the queen. You just at minimum you could just take that off and use it, like exchange up. But is that, that's actually even stronger there. I mean, no, that's that's good enough. So yeah, knight d two threatens rook f one checkmate. Convinces White to resign here. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So in this game, we see Kasparov's use of um, the isolated queen's pawn to generate a lot of counterplay against the king side. Pretty direct stuff. Uh, he has to factor in tactically a uh, knight f5 and e knight e6. When he'd done this stuff, because it seems, yeah, that it was it was dangerous at one point, but yeah, all the tactics work well for him here against White's King. <laughs> it's very dynamic, aggressive stuff. I mean, it looks as though in both the last two games, White had really beautiful positions. To be fair, aesthetically beautiful positions, you know, the double Finchetta and this one, the blockade on D4. I don't know there's this is um how, how did he get his knights to be so aggressive again let's just look at it again how the heck did he do this this knight shift was really dangerous trying to get a knight into h4 it seems white's neglected h4 yeah and this position, if taking this, this is apparently might have been equal for for White. Wasn't that easy? I think maybe taking was better. Well, if White wanted the draw, but yeah, he went in for this forcing kind of stuff. It looks extremely scary this D file. But the knight got into H four. Yeah. weird isn't it it's it's <laughs> it's like pretty direct stuff it's direct stuff everything's kind of pointing if you look at this everything's pointing at white's king already here everything is pointing at white's king well apart from this rook on d8 okay yeah i hope you got something from these games very interesting uh very interesting indeed okay um comments questions likes appreciate it on youtube have a good week see you next week thanks very much